Welcome back to Supreme Myths. I am very excited today to have as my guest Emily Bazelon, who writes for the New York Times Magazine. She is a graduate of Yale College, a graduate of Yale Law School. Um, she is currently a co-host of Slate Gab Fest. She wrote for Slate for many, many years. I think she is one of the most brilliant Supreme Court observers in the country. She's the author of several books, one of which we're going to talk about today, her most recent one called Charged, The New Movement to Transform America, American Prosecution and End Mass Incarceration. Um, Emily, welcome. Glad you're here. Thank you very much. I should just note, I work for the New York Times, just to, to make that clear. I'm sorry. Yes, something. New York Times. Um, okay. You've written some good pieces for New York Times Magazine, too, I believe, right? No? That's my job, so thank yes. you. Okay. Um, I also want to mention that Emily's grandfather is is a very famous judge, maybe the liberal lion before the, there was a liberal lion, uh, named David Bazelon, a D.C. Court of Appeals, and, and uh, a great man who I know something about. So, um, All right. So we're going to talk about your book in the second half. In the first half, I want to talk about, it's an old article, but it's a great article that you wrote in 2018 for the New York Times, where you uh, called When the Supreme Court Lurches Right. And this is before Judge Barrett gets on the court. So this is even before the big turn to the right that just happened. And you began that article by citing a famous political scientist, Robert Dahl. And Robert Dahl said um, that we have to admit that, ju that when judges, the judges decide cases where legal materials in any realistic sense are not up to the task. So my first question is, do you self-identify as a legal realist? And if so, what does that mean to you? So I, let's see. I mean, I do think in legal realist terms. I'm not someone who is cynical about the courts and thinks like there's no abstract legal reasoning going on. I think actually most of what the courts and the Supreme Court do is law in a way that's different from politics because most of the cases don't implicate partisan politics in some you know hot button direct way however the way the supreme court has evolved and mostly in terms of its jurisprudence about the constitution but also sometimes when it's reviewing state laws and federal laws has become more and more political. And so I think ignoring the politics underlying the court's work is like going around kind of half blind. Um, and I think that's kind of obvious to most people. And, you know, frankly, it's obvious from the Constitution in the sense that the president um, appoints justices and so is likely. And when he's allowed to. Likely. Sorry, when he's allowed to. Go ahead. When he's allowed to. <laughs> right. True. Or she. Uh, in, in theory. The president has this power. And so the notion that it's going to be completely separated from partisan politics seems just kind of naive because the president, and I think we've increasingly seen this since the 1980s, is very aware of the partisan politics and implications of his or her pick. And then, of course, you have the Senate's role in confirmation, which has become, if anything, even more politically fraught. So I, I think I have a hard question about this that I have raised with a number of other people on these podcasts, all from legal formalists like Jonathan Adler to legal realists like Jack Balkan. Um, and here's my question about that. So on Twitter, Adler always wants to publicize when the court decides cases 9 nothing and 8-1 and, and how much agreement there is and how much Siegel overstates the politics and all that stuff. My response to that always is, but we don't care about those cases, and those cases don't define our country, and those cases don't define the court, and they don't define who gets to be on the court. The cases that define who gets to be on the court are the ones that Robert Dahl were talking about, the ones you're talking about, abortion, affirmative action, campaign finance reform, guns, et cetera, and sometimes statutory interpretation, like Bostock. Um, and so I don't think it's unfair to try to arrive at a descriptive account of the court based on those cases that are most important to us. So it, is that fair? Yeah, I mean, so Adler's position is like, we'll look at the 90%, and your yeah. position is, we'll look at the 10%, because those are the ones everyone cares about. And yes. if the 10% loom very large in terms of people's perceptions of the court, what they're interested in, and frankly, their lives, then yes, it does seem to me like that is a legitimate way to think about the Supreme Court. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, so so when you wrote this article, um, which made the point that, of course, Barry Friedman has written a whole book about and, and a lot of people accept, uh, 
that um, the court rarely strays too far from the dominant elite opinion, left or right center. When it does, it gets into trouble. Is that a fair summary of of what you were saying there? Yeah, I mean, what I was interested in doing in that piece was thinking about what happens when the court lurches far from a kind of political mainstream position or an emerging political movement. And we've seen this happen in the course of our history um, where the court becomes much more conservative than public opinion. We've also seen it become more liberal um, and that's mostly the Warren court era. And in both instances, you see political backlash. And if you think about our constitutional system, like, of course you do, because again, if you know the court and its appointments are tied to the president and to Congress, then the voters are going to be filtering their decisions about who to elect through their impressions of the court to some degree. So Barry, uh, at least as of six months ago, when I last talked to him about this, Barry thinks that we are edging towards a period of time inconsistent with the thesis of his book. So it's a big thing for him to say. He wrote like an 800-page book on it, um, that the court is going to likely fall out of step. Um, with moderate right politics and, and, and head into an era of reasonably far right politics, and that's going to lead to a crisis. Do you think he's right about that? Well, I mean, I don't want to speak for Barry, but yeah. like the evidence for that position is look at what has happened to Supreme Court appointments um, and judicial appointments generally since the 1980s. So you have these choices by Republican presidents that the kind of um, the Federalist Society, the the academic and legal um, conservative um, movement, the sort of legal movement part of the conservative movement does not like, right? Particularly Justice Souter, but you know, you and I could name three or four other folks who just didn't come through in those people's minds. And so then you have this very successful effort by the Federalist Society in particular, although you know there are other right-wing organizations like Heritage that are also involved in this to become much more influential. And they're basically saying to Republican presidents, like, don't waste this. Like you have a chance to move the Supreme Court to the right. You need to take it. You need to be bold. You need to repay your socially conservative voters who are who really care about this, especially abortions, also guns, but other issues as well. And so I think what you see here is a kind of really um, inexorable march of the Federalist Society and Heritage having more influence over these Supreme Court appointments. And you see presidents start to deliver. Um, and that has, was certainly true during Donald Trump's administration. And of course, because he got to make multiple appointments, that has mattered a great deal to the court's um, conservative makeup. And it was also true to a slightly less degree for George W. Bush. Um, and those folks are also still on the court, as well as, you know, a couple of Reagan folks, at least one who like really came through as well for the right. <laughs> Thomas is what I'm thinking of. My gut tells me that Roberts is going to try everything in his power to not let that happen too much. I mean, that, that, that he is concerned about certainly how history views him in the court. But, but more importantly, I think he is, I, I think maybe, I don't like his heart, don't get me wrong. But in his heart, I think maybe Justice Roberts doesn't think the court should play that kind of role but he may not be able to stop it. In fact, I'm kind of thinking he's not going to be able to stop it. Do you agree with that? Well, I think Chief Justice Roberts is in this increasingly fascinating position where yeah. it's the Roberts court, right? It has his name on it. And so the court's legacy matters to him to a degree that I don't think is true for any of the eight other eight people who sit on the bench with him. And he is very aware that, you know, what is called the Lochner Court in particular is seen as this very embarrassing moment in Supreme Court history where the court went off the rails to the right in a way that really damaged the country and damaged the court's reputation. And obviously, that's not the only time the court has been accused of doing that. I mean, it also ended Reconstruction in a way that I think looks terrible now. Yes. Um, Same problem. So I would agree with you that I don't think Roberts wants that same kind of legacy. Um, And so I would also argue that his um, 
ways to, of dealing with this is to pick his battles and to try to move incrementally. And so evidence for your thesis is, you know, his vote saying no Trump administration, you can't willy nilly add a, a, a question about citizenship to the census when you've given us what is clearly like a false justification for that. We can see that's kind of embarrassing. <laughs> um, there are other instances of Roberts taking that more, uh, you know, what looks like sort of centrist position. On the other hand, Roberts is the author of Shelby County, which is the decision from the last decade that has, you know, shaken the foundations of um, protecting the right to vote the most. Um, and there are other cases in which he has shown, you know, deeply conservative impulses. So now he's trying to sort of herd cats because there are five people that look like they're to his right and might be moving and excuse me and might be interested in moving significantly faster than him. And so why does it really matter what he thinks to them? It's hard to say exactly how that plays out because we don't know exactly what the internal dynamics are, but certainly one imagines that those, you know, heated conversations are taking place within the court. Yeah, it may it may make a big difference to cert grants in terms of timing, I think. Maybe. But, yes. But 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 who knows? And we're having this interesting what appears to be kind of pause on abortion, right? Where there's this case from Mississippi that would impose a 15 week ban on abortions. And it's been sitting there on the docket and the court hasn't decided whether to take it or not. And so that looks like some kind of indication that there's some sort of hesitancy going on that might have to do, who knows, with the court's awareness of the 2022 election or with these internal questions about how fast they move and Robert's attempt to influence that question. Did you just say that the court Cert grants may depend to some limited degree on how they view how those cases will affect general elections. Did I hear you? I did think, I hear you say that? I did say that because I think again, like there's something silly. I'm raising about my fist not. to you, Emily. <laughs> <laughs> I, so to me, it's not that I know that that's the case. I just think pretending that that's like an unacceptable um, issue to put on the table is is just it doesn't seem to correlate very well with reality and the Supreme Court's history. So that's why I mention it. So if I don't mention Posner once a podcast, people who listen to it get, um, think I've lost my brain or something because I mentioned him once a podcast. He once yelled at me. We were talking about this issue, about the timing of big decisions vis-a-vis -vis elections. And I said, that's not a legal thing. It's not a legal thing. Someone should think about it. If, if, they, if they were real judges, they wouldn't think about that. He yelled at me and said, of course, it's a real thing. It's a consequence. And they should take into account consequences. And that's a huge consequence. Right. Um, I, well, Judge no, I, Posner is a deep pragmatist, and he cares a great deal about consequences. And I think he also thinks it's silly to pretend that these things don't enter into the minds of judges. Like, yeah. they are also people who live in the world and read the news. You and I agree on that. He agreed on that. You'd be amazed how much pushback I get on that point when I talk about it, leaving that aside. Um, one more question about um, the Supreme Court, and then we'll get to your great book. Um, so you mentioned heritage and Cato, a fairless society and heritage before. And I've been dying to make this point on this podcast, and, and you've given me a great opportunity to do so, and you're kind of plugged in. So I'm curious what you think. So in your newspaper, um, Carolyn Ryan Fredrickson and I wrote an op-ed criticizing FedSoc and not even on the substance, just transparency. Just admit what you're doing and we'll be happy and go – just admit it and they won't admit it, of course. I think I've decided in the last – I also know the person at Heritage who Adam Liptak of your newspaper suggested was behind the list that Trump did. But in fact, turned out he wasn't behind the list. He was the face man for the list. But leaving all that aside. The rank and file of FedSoc that I know, my students, lawyers, I, I do appearances all the time for them, students and lawyers. They are not massively Trump supporters, and they are not to the right of, um, they are to the left of Thomas and Alito, and you know, they're, they're to the left of those people. Not true for heritage. And I think when history is going to be told, it was heritage, not the Federalist Society, that actually really was successful in getting nutty judges like Justin Walker on, on the bench. Do you have any thoughts about that? That's interesting. I mean, 
I, you know, it's possible that reporters have kind of fallen for what looks like the, yes. you know, power of particularly Leonard Leo, who's the yes. head of the Federalist Society, has yeah. gotten a lot of attention yeah. for being a kind of kingmaker in the role yes. of um, judicial appointees. It's also possible that you're right, but that the influence of heritage um, is greater uh, below the Supreme Court level. So, you know, Justin Walker is not on the Supreme Court yet. Or that maybe heritage is driving this, but then Federalist Society goes along with it, or cert or you know, I'm not right. I'm not sure how much yeah. power these two organizations have. Um, right. I mean, I'm more interested in a reporter at looking at the results, right? Yeah. So like it's interesting to think about who's pulling the strings, but it's also we can just see that we have these deeply conservative appointees. Yeah, I um I hope that story is eventually told. I think it's important. I think it goes back to, I'm not going to remember the guy who founded Heritage, who died a few years ago, but he was a kingmaker. I'm not, I'm not going to remember his name, but I, I, I think Heritage's role in this was understated. I, I'll just say that. Um, all right. Um, let's shift gears. Um, this book that you wrote a few years ago, um, The New Movement to Transform American, Prosec American Prosecution and End Mass Incarceration. Um, and you tell it Largely through the stories of two people, at least substantially through the stories of two people. First question, tell the audience what is our problem with mass incarceration and how serious is it? Well, our main problem with mass incarceration is that our rate of imprisoning people has quintupled since the 1970s. And we have a greater percentage of people behind bars in this country than any country like us in the world. Um, just a huge number, still over 2 million people. And that was a choice that we made in part because of rising crime in the 70s and 80s, in part, I think, because of um, racial stereotypes and a real kind of distancing that white people did from the harm that was being done to black people who have borne the brunt of mass incarceration. And I would argue that, you know, our incarceration rates have far, far outstripped what's necessary for deterring crime and just done a tremendous amount of damage to communities, especially low income communities, rural and urban. Um, and my book is about the role that prosecutors have played in right. that um, whole phenomenon of mass incarceration, because um, I thought at the time that that was a kind of unappreciated part of the story. I think you're right about that. Um, you talk about how much discretion prosecutors have, how they use that discretion and, and, and something that I maybe I underestimated a little bit. How much it varies, right, throughout the country? That was kind of the point of your two examples, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, prosecutors until maybe, you know, let's say five years ago, basically almost always ran for office on a kind of lock them up agenda. <laughs> like, what's your conviction rate? What huge sentences can you point to? Um, you know, how many times did you impose the death penalty or try to impose the death penalty, I should say, since that's a decision that ultimately judges make. And that was the playbook. And I think everybody assumed you had to play by those rules to win an election. It turns out that's not true. And we know that because um, since 2016, in now dozens of cities across the country, people have run for district attorney and won by promising to shrink the footprint of the criminal justice system, make it more fair and punish people less. And that's a movement that, you know, to some degree came out of Black Lives Matter. Um, mm -hmm. It's also become very much a cause of civil rights groups around the country. And it, it shows it has harnessed the power of vote of local voters because your district attorney or your state attorney's race is not statewide. It's your city or your county. And, and there are also what are called low salience elections. Not that many people pay a huge amount of attention or even show up to vote, depending on when the election is. And so it turns out that if you mobilize your people, you can get a district attorney who's going to answer to the constituency that is actually impacted by criminal justice policy, as opposed to like the white people from the suburbs who may have a lot of kind of um, inchoate fear of crime, but aren't really thinking about, you know, what all this lock them up really leads to. How much of this, that's a leading question, but how much, how much of this is drug related? I mean, it's so drugs are not a huge statistical part of the picture of mass incarceration. Really? Look at 
Yeah, they're not, because people cycle in and out, generally speaking, for drug crimes, they're not doing a huge amount of time. And so when you look at mass incarceration, statistically, the people who have longer sentences for violent crime make up a larger share. Huh. That said, and I mean, I think this is a, a huge insight that I should credit to Michelle Alexander and the new Jim Crow, the war on drugs and the way it was racialized was tremendously um, significant in driving mass incarceration. Um, white people and black people use drugs at the same rate, but we see arrests and charging in convictions and imprisonment of black people for you know, this crime um, much more than white people. And that kind of way in which um, you know, the mass incarceration picture developed, I think, has, was really important in its perpetuation. You know, I was watching, my wife and I are re-watching, don't shoot us, the first few seasons of The West Wing. And what most amazes me about her, us, both of us, about that, and this is 1998, 99, 2000, I don't know exactly, but somewhere in that room, all of the issues that Sorkin obsesses about are still with us today. And the episode we watched last night was about the mass racial disparities between crack cocaine and regular cocaine and, and how frustrated... The, the characters were with the Clinton era, you know, signing of that bill and all that stuff. Um, it, it feels like, to me, not that much has gotten better. And here's my question. Uh, I, this is not my area. Uh, Carissa Hessick of uh, UNC Law School, um, and, and she and I have a, a fun relationship because we disagree a lot, but I hope civilly and cordially. But I had her on, and she is an expert on this. And she laid a lot of this at plea bargaining. And she's not the first person to tell me that. So I'm wondering where plea bargaining fits into all this. Yeah. So if you think about the role the prosecutors play, charging and plea bargaining, blah, charging and plea bargaining is where they have the most power, right? right? It's up to prosecutors what crime gets charged. And then it's largely up to them to shape the deal that goes into a plea bargain. Judges have to approve it. For the most part, that's a rubber stamp. And so you know, one of the things that you see in this area is that when you have um, an ability of prosecutors to bring multiple criminal charges because you have more and more things that are illegal, legislators just like expand the criminal code. And when they have the power to charge in a lot of cases, mandatory minimum sentences, you see this weighting of the whole power in the system. It moves from judges to prosecutors. Because if you charge a crime that has a mandatory minimum sentence, then the punishment is effectively baked into the crime. And then you can leverage that at plea bargaining. You can say, if you plead guilty, I'm going to give you what looks like a really good deal. Well, it only looks like a deal because you're facing a huge amount of time because of the way the charges have been um, right. brought. And so I think that is probably the dynamic that Carissa was talking about. That's so interesting. Um, this is kind of a center field question, and I mean that literally. So Clark Nelly of Cato has been on my podcast. And, you know, he and I agree on very little, but, but, but I think he's a good guy and, and really smart. And he and liberals agree on that. Like Cato and liberals agree on this question. Like there's almost universal agreement on this issue. Why can't they, why can't, I'm the, the, again, this is, you know, if we were talking abortion, affirmative action, Second Amendment, I, I can play a role. I can't play a role here because I don't, this isn't my area. Why can't those two groups get together and do something? I mean, it seems like everybody agrees. Well, so to some degree, those two groups have gone together and done a whole bunch of things at the state level, right? And Correct. I think what you're talking about here is a, a marriage between liberals who are concerned about civil rights and justice and the incarceration of low income, particularly black and Latino communities right. and conservatives who are worried about libertarian principles. Right. Like, where does the state have more power than when they like take your freedom away and also return on investment? So you have a number of red states like Texas and Oklahoma and Georgia that have pulled back on their very harsh sentencing schemes because they are spending just a ton of money locking people up. Those people come out ill prepared to return to you know life on the outside and then they go right back in and that does not serve anyone's interest so on the state level i think we are seeing some changes and the movement to elect prosecutors who promise progressive changes is one that includes some republican state attorneys as well as democrats I think what you're if you want to talk, though, about why uh, the political consensus on, I think, or it's not consensus, at least like groundswell of support for decarceration, why it hasn't touched plea bargaining. 
Um, if that's your question, then you have to reckon with the fact that we have a system now where between 97 and 98 percent of convictions are obtained through plea bargaining. Yeah. It is just the engine that drives everything. Um, cases get dismissed or they get plea bargained. The number of trials is vanishingly rare, even though we're obsessed with them. They're great stories, right? <laughs> I'm sure many of your listeners are paying attention to the trial of Derek Chauvin right now. Why is that trial happening? Because the Attorney General of the United States refused to sign on to a plea bargain, um, which would have given Chauvin 10 years in prison. So. Plea bargaining is so um, essential to the functioning of the system that it's hard for the people who work in that system to imagine even just reducing its role. And it's hard to figure out exactly how that would come about. Yeah, I, I, I think that's exactly right. I also think politicians, this is not an issue that people running for office necessarily want to run with. And that's a shame given the documented harm <laughs> that that plea bargaining is causing. Right. I mean, there have been some of these newly elected district attorneys who have looked at the trial rates in their um, in their cities and counties and said, yeah, you know, we can afford to have more trials. And one thing we're going to do is not charge the highest possible charge if we don't think that's fair. And that reduces the pressure to plead guilty. And so in theory, could lead to more trials. OK, um, I know you only have a, we have only five minutes left. We have breaking news or at least it's rumored breaking news. I, so let's, let's both admit this has only been rumored so far. It appears that Justice Barrett has received a $2 million book deal. And you know, that, that, that just happened this morning. If you hadn't, sorry, I didn't mean to catch okay, you off guard. I didn't hear of it. So I'm glad to know that it's only because I wasn't paying attention for one day instead of like you know, two weeks. Of two million. That's <laughs> what you got for your book. I know what I got for my, you know, um, uh, and if reports are true, again, we're, we're both agreeing here. This is I, I, I listen to a sports talk show where they do a rank speculation alert. This is rank speculation, everybody. But what's being reported is $2 million to write a book about how feelings shouldn't and don't matter to judges deciding cases. That they should put their feet. So we're going to circle back to the first thing we talked about. They should put their feelings aside. If that is true. And it wouldn't surprise me if it is. If that is true, how do, how do we live in a world where a Supreme Court justice can write a book or is going to write a book that almost everybody who pays attention knows to be false? What is it about our Supreme What I mean, what is it about our Supreme My last question to you for this podcast is why is there such a myth around the, fall the, the infallibility or the how, how our Supreme Court operates? She's going to write this book, get $2 million. She's going to say, I just follow the law, text, history, plug it in, come out of the winner. You have five minutes. I'm giving you a full five minutes or you can take 10 seconds. So Susanna Sherry at Vanderbilt thinks the celebrity justice is a real problem. Like it's a real, real, real problem. And it's changed the way America views the Supreme Court. RBG is guilty. Scalia is guilty. Barrett's going to be guilty. Sotomayor, to some extent, is a little guilty of that. Why, do, if she writes this book and says, I, my feelings don't matter. <laughs> I mean, she's going to say that, I think. We know that's not true. You, we, we agreed on it earlier. We, we know in abortion cases and affirmative action cases and gun cases, she can't help, not her, they all can't help but bring in their priors. Posner wrote books about this for decades. I'm just asking if you have any quick soundbite or soundbite plus, because you have still have five minutes, theory as to how we've got this celebrity culture of the Supreme Court and, and why Americans both, in every poll, rate them higher than everybody else, but also know that it's in the big cases, it's mostly values and politics. How did we get here? Well, I'm interested in the idea of this book because Justice Gorsuch actually wrote a version of this book like two years ago, one year ago, and yes. got paid much less money for it. Um, yes. So I just note that for the record, <laughs> this account is in fact true. I mean, I think that we wrestle with a country with what it means that judges do something different from legislators, right? Like they're not elected. They wear black robes. They write long things that seem dense and te technical to most people. 
what is this thing called law that they do that is different from politics? And it does seem like there is a kind of insatiable appetite, I think, especially among conservatives to come up with an answer to that question, right? So liberals for a while have been willing to say like, yes, we do take values into account when we make these decisions. We think about the impact our decisions are gonna have. We were talking before about Judge Posner's theories about this. Justice Breyer has also written. Right. Um, and to a degree, I think Sotomayor and um, Ginsburg as well were grappling with this in a more kind of legal realist um, <laughs> set of terms, like the one that you would use. But on the conservative side of the spectrum, we've had this deep attachment to originalism, this idea that if you look at um, the original public meaning of the Constitution, there the answers lie and judges can use that as a formula that is going to be somehow detached from their values. I mean, I wrote a big piece about this, I think last year for the Times, and I tried to take that claim really seriously, especially in its incarnation in Justice Gorsuch's book, but also, you know, Justice Thomas has been very attached to this. Um, and I think the problem is that it just doesn't hold up to scrutiny because it's never applied uniformly, right? And so Justice Scalia, who was like the first or a, an early version of the celebrity <laughs> justice was pretty upfront about this in the beginning. He called himself a faint hearted originalist. He cited times in which like, no, he wasn't gonna follow the fact that, you know, the original Supreme Court said that like someone could be branded as their punishment under the eighth amendment because at the time that was what the understanding of cruel and unusual punishment allowed for. I think since then, what we have seen with these theories is they've kind of calcified and become more rigid because they only work in the according to their own standards if they're binding and so i think that's why we keep seeing legal thinkers take a swing at this and i'll be interested to see um justice barris version of it i think justice gorsuch's book which i reviewed um is a is, is one of the great symbols of originalism ever and here's why um he 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 defends originalism in the book and it's horrible and it's unpersuasive and i won't bore you with that he, he says the problem with Dred Scott was that it wasn't originalist. Well, of course, it was originalist. But leaving all that aside, um, he fancies himself this Coloradoan cowboy Westerner with a hat. He went to the same freaking elite private school as Kavanaugh. His mother was the head of the EPA. So his original, his, his, his originalist personality is D.C. all the way down. And trying to hide that through a Colorado hat doesn't work, and neither does his jurisprudence. Sorry for that, for that rant, but it's just true. Emily, thank you so much for coming on. I really enjoyed talking to you. I'm going to see you again. On, I'm going to hear you again on Wednesday night, I think, when we're both yes. doing some kind of new technology thing about court reform. <laughs> We're going to be on Clubhouse, which is like the live version of podcasts. It will also be my maiden voyage onto Clubhouse. Um, but yes, I look forward to that um, the that as well. And thank you so much for having me, Eric. It was a pleasure. It was my pleasure. Thanks.